Today's mountain trail leads us back to Gold Rush City, Dahlonega, Georgia, where we explore a bell that never rang. today in Dahlonega, Georgia with Chris Warwick, who is the Vice President of the Lumpkin County Historical Society. Right. And he has a wonderful new project that they've just put, finished up this past November. And I'm going to ask Chris to give us an overview of exactly what we have here. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Sure. Um, what we've got here is a very rare relic from the 19th century. And uh, it's what we've termed it as is the 1875 Chestity River Diving Bell. And this unique artifact has a very interesting history in the fact that not only is it a survivor from the 19th century and a one-of-a-kind artifact, but also that the location, being here mm -hmm. in Dahlonega in the mountains of North Georgia, this is something that you would typically find on the coast somewhere by a sea town such as Savannah, mm -hmm. Charleston, perhaps even New York. And we found this back in 1981, and the story uh, goes back to 1875 when an entrepreneur named Philologus Hawkins or P.H. Loud um, had the idea to try to use a diving bell to mine the bottom of the Chesity River mm -hmm. and search for gold. And this is this is the spot of the uh, great gold rush in America that a lot of people don't know about. They think about the gold rush being in California. Well, Dahlonega was huge in gold mining, and we've done several shows on the gold mines here. Mm -hmm. But this is a different aspect of it. Uh, they used this bell that we'll show in just a little bit to go down into the river and to send people down to mine for the gold mm -hmm. here. And you have brought this out of the river and done extensive work on it. And now you have a beautiful pavilion right off the square here in Dahlonega mm -hmm. at um, uh, Hancock Park. Hancock Park, and which is a beautiful park right next to us, just a block off the square. So uh, we're going to show a little bit of that later. Mm -hmm. And then so many people were involved. You've got the list of people, a lot of money involved. Mm -hmm. But the Lumpkin County Historical Society has done a wonderful job. Beautiful pavilion, and the restoration has been amazing. So let's talk a little bit more about your background. You were with the Army, and then That's you great. came to North Georgia mm -hmm. to work there, and then you got in with it. A historical society here and you're basically in charge of this event. Well sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, yeah, when I retired in 2004 from the Army we decided to stay down here because I'm originally from Michigan mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't miss the Michigan winters and so we decided to stay here in the beautiful mountains of North Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, so in staying here I've always had a very good interest in history and uh, decided that it would be a good idea to learn about the uh, gold mine yeah. history mm -hmm. of the area. Um, in so doing uh, I ran across several articles in the newspapers from the 1870s which talked about this uh, diving bell or caisson, as mm -hmm. they called it, um, that was going to be used as a new means of mining the riverbed. And I had never read about anything mm -hmm. like this or really had a knowledge about this. And so I started researching this. And um, one of our local historians and authors, Ann Amerson, also mm -hmm. uh, had written about this previously in one of her books uh, years before. And so she had a basic knowledge of it, and she was the one that actually, you know, convinced me and helped move me along mm -hmm. to, you know, research more about this uh, unique artifact. Let me ask you right here: uh, Had this type of bell been used anywhere else in the nation? Had it ever been used in California, or, uh, or is this an original to this area? Well, what makes it unique is that uh, this type of diving bell mm -hmm. is the only known survivor from the 19th century that we know of. Mm -hmm. um, diving bells were in use for centuries before mm -hmm. and they still are in use today, primarily in oh. the areas of uh, underwater salvage, recovery, mm -hmm. and things like this. But for this particular one, it's the only known type uh, or attempt to mine for gold east of the Mississippi. Um, after the Civil War, there was a lot of new uh, industrial technologies that mm -hmm. were becoming available. Mm -hmm. And so I had read about uh, in the 18, early 1870s, um, several attempts off the coast of California to mine not only the rivers but also yeah. the surf area uh, mm -hmm. in several places with diving bells out there. Not this type, mm -hmm. but different ones. They were unsuccessful, but it shows that they were having this as an idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is really this is an amazing uh, apparatus, and it is it's so heavy. Mm -hmm. Were there other materials that they could have used besides the iron? 
that maybe could have um, made it a little bit easier for them to they, work with? They could have, but for this type of iron, that was the easiest thing that they had to work mm -hmm. with at that time, and that was kind of the technology yeah. of the day. This particular one is uh, basically boilerplate iron reinforced with iron uh, straps and rivets. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier model diving bells were basically a little bit smaller and were constructed primarily of wood with uh, iron reinforcements. Um, they right. weren't as technolog uh, technologically advanced as this particular mm -hmm. one. Um, and what actually helped save this thing from being destroyed, because this is why I said it was a unique survivor, was because um, when this thing had sank in 1876 in the river, it was forgotten about. Basically, the sands of the time mm -hmm. uh, had covered it up. Um, but during World War One and World War II, when you had a lot of these scrap metal drives, things like this that weren't being used anymore were being melted down and you know turned oh. into tanks and aircraft and things like that. So basically, that's what saved it was you mm -hmm. know being buried in the river. Right. Oh, that's great. So. Um, now this, we'll get more into the uh, specifics of it, but this big 4,000? No, four ton. Four ton, mm -hmm. four ton, uh, 4,000 pound apparatus was set on a 50 by 17 barge type. Correct. Boat, and it was in the middle, and mm -hmm. they would lower that down to the river bend. Right. Now, the person that was in there, one or two? Mm -hmm. uh, two is what we uh, configured would probably be the, the, the best, mm -hmm. most optimal. They would number. go down the tower, go, you, what do you call it? The airlock. The air, they'll go down the airlock, go in there, and we don't know exactly how they mined. Right. But uh, eventually, I'm sure you'll find that out. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but. That's scary being in there. I, I would think that would be really a job. I want. Do you know anything about how long people stay there? Did they do a 12-hour shift, or you know how it is down in the coal mines here? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the gold mines here, how long people had to stay down there? Do you know anything about that yet? Um, in theory, they could stay down there for possibly six to eight hours because it was pressurized, and so they had a way that you know they were being provided with fresh oxygen yeah. uh, while they were working inside there. Uh, I would imagine. Uh, once they had expended the area that they were digging around and looking for gold, they would mm -hmm. probably um, go back up through the airlock to the surface boat and then they would hoist the diving bell back up and then move it again a little bit farther yeah. down the river and then dump it. Mm -hmm. um, what makes it unique is that we call it a diving bell, but that isn't totally um, an accurate name for this. It could be the, the actual patent which the, Mr. Loud had mm -hmm. uh, later was called a floating caisson. And uh, caissons were basically a fixed or semi-permanent type structure that they could lower to the riverbed or seafloor um, where workmen would go down inside there and actually make contact or would sit on the floor of the riverbed mm -hmm. and so on. Um, this one could do both. Uh, whereas a diving bell was kind of like you could lower it down and then it would hover or be suspended over the area that you wanted to work, such as if you were going to recover some cannons from a sunken mm -hmm. ship. The men would probably wear waist-high type rubber waders or something mm -hmm. like this and they would get their feet wet, but basically they could attach ropes or cables to um, cannons or yeah. whatever they were bringing back up oh, and then God. it would be hoisted up back up to the surface boat. Um, with this one, depending on the river bed, if mm -hmm. it was a smooth river bottom, which I think that you would typically find around here, you could make contact and set this thing into the river bottom. Mm -hmm. um, the river at that time, uh, when this would have been in operation in the late 1870s, probably would have been a lot deeper mm -hmm. than the river is to now, uh, than it is now. Um, what makes it unique is that we don't exactly know how it operated. There's two theories. Either they shoveled a lot of the gravel into bins, which are located mm -hmm. on the inside of the diving bell, and then hoisted the bell back to the boat, and then emptied the bins out. Into and, sluice. Right, and then searched for gold like mm -hmm. that. Or, um, from one of the newspaper accounts, it mentioned using a vacuum-type dredging system, which is something similar to what mm -hmm. a lot of um, gold miners that are, you know, do this recreationally today. It was basically oh, like really? a giant vacuum hose yeah, under the water and yeah. then they could shovel the dirt into mm -hmm. the vacuum there, suck it up to the mm -hmm. surface boat on, onto sluice boxes and go through it like that. Right. Well, Chris, what really started this off? Where did you find this, and what was the impetus to bring it here and to make it a tourist attraction? Well, and it's very fascinating, by the way. From from the research that I came up with, uh, Mr. Loud, it was after the Civil mm -hmm. War, and just like a lot of other men uh, from the South, they were looking for ways to try to, you know, in increase their capital because mm -hmm. the South had been devastated, obviously, right. uh, in this area. Um, Mr. Loud had served with the 10th Georgia Regiment during the war and had served as a major. Um, 
Once he got out, um, the Loud family originally had come from Philadelphia. They were uh, well-known piano makers. Oh. And so um, Mr. Loud, prior to the Civil War, they were involved in a lot of different um, entrepreneur entrepreneurial aspects as far as timber, land, um, and things like this. After the war, we see that um, he was involved with coal, mm -hmm. uh, purchasing coal down in Atlanta. Um, one story was actually pretty funny because he was uh, advertising himself as a uh, expert in animal magnetism. So basically like snake oil, uh, which we saw in a Cincinnati newspaper, Louisville and New Orleans. So he was making the rounds. But um, I think what got him into this was that when the gold rush had started back in the early uh, 1830s, mm -hmm. his family, uh, his father, John Loud, and three of his brothers had come down from Philadelphia and spent a very large amount of money uh, and invested in what is still known as the Loud Gold Mine, which is right across the uh, county line in White County now. Mm -hmm. It's still known as the Loud Gold Mine. And they were involved in gold mining for a very short period. And so that was, I guess, his father's first aspect mm -hmm. or um, experience working with gold. And so he probably had this idea. But I think what got them really started the idea of you know trying to use a diving bell was that for a good part of over 50 years, um, there had been gold mining going on in this area. Uh, but nobody ever, ever really exploited or tried to exploit the possibility of gold that might exist in the river. In the beds. river. So they uh, were, everybody was digging. Right. Underground um, now and, th and there were several the mountains down and right. Th there were yeah. several attempts, you know, um, very rudimentary and actually crude methods to try to use what they called shovel boats, were basically nothing longer than like large canoes mm -hmm. with men with really long handled shovels that would go down and dig into the bottom of the riverbed and try to come up with gold like that. Obviously, very primitive and yeah. not very uh, effective. Um, and so no one had ever tried this. And so what what I found in my research was when I started looking at the deed records. Um, Mr. Loud and his son Charles, who was also with the company that they had organized in 1873, uh -huh. began leasing certain properties along the Chesity River. Now by themselves, that didn't really tell me anything, but when I put that all together on a map and looked at the land lots that um, were being leased, it made perfect sense because they were at or close to the existing gold mines at uh -huh. that time that were being very profitable. And so the theory was, was that a lot of this gold was being washed into the river, and so no one had ever touched this. So it's got a lot of potential that mm -hmm. they can make a lot of money doing this. Now, the Chesity River, uh, Highway 60, goes uh, south out of Dahlonega mm -hmm. toward 400. That's correct. The Chesity River weaves back and forth mm -hmm. under 60. Mm -hmm. Most of the gold mines are on, as, as we're going south, on the left side. Mm -hmm. So um, they just thought maybe that some of this gold was being washed into the river. That's correct. Because you, know, you know how they tore the mountains down mm -hmm. with the, the water blasting? Right. And so that was coming into the river, and so they saw a gold mine. Mm -hmm. So they uh, came up with this, and how successful do you think it was? Do you well, have any ideas? From, from the newspaper accounts, it doesn't sound like they were very successful, mm -hmm. and if they were, they were being very tight-lipped about it. I think <laughs> miners are kind of like that in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the problem they ran into mostly was a lot of mechanical failures, because mm -hmm. besides just the diving bell itself, uh, we had a lot of machinery, uh, steam pumps, uh, engines and boilers on the right. boat itself in order to try to make this thing work. And I think that from the newspaper accounts, it mentions that they have several mechanical problems uh -huh. uh, that affected them you know, being successful right. doing this. So we think this was built in 1875, mm -hmm. and then in just a few years, maybe even 1876, it, they had a terrible, terrible winter. The boat was basically destroyed. For well, the, the, the boat wasn't really destroyed. From what we gather is that um, they started operating and we're starting to get things underway about uh, September, October time frame mm -hmm. of 1875. There was one account that even talked about Mr. Loud was the first one to take the inaugural descent oh. and go down the diving bell and that mm -hmm. he, he supposedly saw much, so much gold he couldn't sleep that oh, night. Yeah. He was so excited and if it was that profitable mm -hmm. then he would build one of the same type <laughs> again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> he had visions of grandeur, that's for sure. Um, but. Um, they couldn't have foresaw this, but in the winter of 1875 to 76, they had uh, constantly being reported in the newspapers incessant rain and floodings in mm -hmm. the area. Uh, so much so that several bridges had been washed out. There was one brand new gold mine uh, and stamp mill which was completely destroyed. Oh, really? Um, but we have a later account of when the boat sank in October of 1876 that refers back to that winter, and it talked about that at one point. Um, the boat, which had been tied up somewhere along the river, had gotten loose, mm -hmm. and it took the you know Herculean efforts of the crew in order to rescue the boat and keep it from being swept downstream and uh, smashed to pieces mm -hmm. on the shoals. So what we think happened was that the boat, the diving bell, or maybe both, 
had incurred some type of damage because after this you don't really see uh, or, or read any newspaper accounts oh. of the boat operating. And so we think they were laid up for a while waiting mm -hmm. on repair parts because this was the only show in town uh, mm -hmm. as far as this goes until there was no um, repair shops or anything close by. Um, so fast forward then to um, 1980, 81, 81 mm -hmm. when uh, this was, people would come by here and they would see the pipe. Mm -hmm. And they thought it was a boat that was submerged, but they didn't realize it was this type of situation. That's right. And so from 81 to, what, what was the progression from 1981 to how you got to here today? Okay. Uh, in 1981, there was a local um, gold prospector named John Weingart, mm -hmm. and uh, they had the idea that what was sticking out of the river was the remains of a smokestack from one of the old steamboats because right. they did use mining boats later after mm -hmm. you know this diving bell operation didn't work and so his theory was that if there was a sunken gold mining boat in the river there must be gold associated with yeah. it and so at that okay. time it was owned by um, what was called the Owens Farms um, which is now the Achasta Golf Course mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Weingard got the foreman uh, and convinced him to use their four-wheel drive pickup truck to try to haul this thing oh, out really? of the river. Well, that didn't work, so they <laughs> finally progressed to using a, a bulldozer, which had enough uh, pulling power, mm -hmm. and when they pulled this out of the river, they found that it wasn't a boat. Well, it was actually attached to a boat. They found this diving bell so there. The whole thing and was so, still attached. Correct. And uh, they, they even pulled the gear that was still attached with the cables on the front of the uh, the diving bell out so, with it. So they didn't know it was a diving bell. That's they right. thought it was a smoker or? Well, they thought it was part of a steamboat, you know, yeah, like a, a big boiler. Boat, yeah, right. big boiler. And um, so after that, how when they pulled it out of the river, then what did they do with it? Well, did they, they didn't really quite know what to do with it. They knew it was something interesting. And they knew it was old. Um, unfortunately, a lot of items that were first uh, inside it, because it was a time mm -hmm. capsule basically, have been pilfered because uh, there was a lot of curiosity seekers and people coming up and down the river. So over time, um, things have disappeared. disappeared. We see a lot of old photographs that show other pieces of the diving bell, which we mm -hmm. no longer have. But uh, from 1981, really until the property, the Owens Farms was sold and to become the golf course, um, it just laid and languished by the river up there because nobody had an idea what to do with it. Um, they finally moved it to what was the maintenance facility uh, where it sat for a number of other years. Hmm. And it went through a couple other um, attempts to try to refurbish this thing, but nothing really ever came about until really around 2007. In 2007, we had a diver who was visiting the area um, and saw this or had heard about it when he was doing a canoe trip with really? one of the Appalachian Outfitters uh, mm -hmm. people. And he was curious to see this thing. Some, something like this, how would this end up in the mountains of North Georgia? <laughs> Well, when he saw this, he recognized it as being historically significant. And so he started making some phone calls, uh, sent some emails out to people in the nautical, naval, and maritime community who might have some interest yeah. or you know, knowledge on this. And he did get back a response. And come to find out, they, they thought this turned out to be um, what they thought was a, a Benjamin Malifert uh, type of diving bell. And Mr. Malifert had a patent for what we thought looks very similar to this one in 1858. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, then the interest really started picking up until we were able to get this thing restored in 2010. Mm -hmm. So who here in Dahlonega really took hold of this and, and got you moving on it? Well, Because um, you have done an extensive, extensive amount of well, work. Well, Ann Amerson, great. like I said, was the one that really got me involved in this. And between Ann and myself, uh, she organized a committee, mm -hmm. uh, Chesapeake River Diving Bell Committee, which was made up by local uh, persons who had an interest in trying to save this unique artifact. And Anne is a local? She's a local historian, historian member of the Historical here? Society, yeah. and also an author that's written mm -hmm. uh, numerous books and contributed to uh, the Georgia Backroads magazine. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, we had talked to uh, two of our local um, people who are part of the uh, Chamber of Commerce and mm -hmm. uh, active in the community, Bill and Helen Hardiman. And Bill had been the first tourism director for, uh, for the state of Georgia and lives here in Dahlonega. Oh, yeah. um, and, and Bill had recommended, well, why don't you talk to Mike Cottrell, who owns the, the Cottrell Ranch here in town. And, you know, Mike might be able to help contribute because that's basically what it boiled down to was funding. We needed some mm -hmm. type of funding in order to save this thing and then a location on where to put it. Um, once we had contacted Mike, he, without hesitation, you know, offered the use of his facility mm -hmm. of Cottrell Incorporated over in Gainesville to help restore this thing. And so, sure enough, in the summer of 2010, uh, they built a specially constructed harness to really? move the diving yeah. bell. They brought a truck over here, lifted it up, and took the diving bell, the whole kit and caboodle, over to their facility. And for the next six weeks, they restored the diving mm -hmm. bell, you know, actually probably better than it was in 1875. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's as far as diving belts goes, mm -hmm. very nice. Right.
I just assumed this was built here, but it was not. No. And can you tell me where you think it was built, the history of that, and how did it get here? Mm -hmm. That was a very big puzzle because a lot mm -hmm. of folks, you know, something this unusual, how did this end up in the mountains of North Georgia? Mm -hmm. Well, after uh, Cottrell Incorporated had uh, restored the diving bell, it went into storage for some uh, some time because mm -hmm. we didn't have enough funding at that time to build the pavilion. And so that gave me a great opportunity to really go over the exterior of the diving bell looking for any type of markings mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I was very successful. Um, I found some actual foundry marks stamped into the side of the diving bell which indicated it, at least the plates were cast at the Pottstown Iron Company of Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And not knowing anything about this, I had to do some research and come to find out there was a, a, a very big iron producing industry in Pottstown. Mm -hmm. And so Mr. Loud, we know that this family originally come from Philadelphia and so there's the Pennsylvania connection. Mm -hmm. um, as I continued to look around the diving bell for any other indications, the right side was almost like a treasure trove that had been overlooked all these years. Oh, wow. And yeah. there was original handwritten uh, messages or writing on there that were basically shipping instructions. Scratched into it, it or, was painted or on painted, there. painted right. on there? And, and it had been covered over, but when you looked at it in just the right light, you can actually see it slightly raised against oh. the surface right there. Mm -hmm. um, and when you start looking at it and put it all together, they're actually numbered. It actually says N01, N02, and so forth for each plate. So I believe that the plates were cast at Pottstown and this thing was shipped as a kit of some sorts. Shipped as in, you think maybe the a train and train then trainer by ship, yeah. Or by train ship, or by okay. ship. Mm -hmm. And then and then brought into the area from there. But. Right. Um, and the reason I was saying that is because uh, there was one message that was very telltale at the very center on the right side, but it's written upside down. Uh, strangely enough, uh -huh. and it said ship via CCD line Gainesville, Georgia. Uh -huh. So we know Gainesville is still the closest rail mm -hmm. uh, point to Dahlonega. So that would have been the ending yep. point. But the CCD line was very curious because I didn't know what that acronym was. After a little bit of research, I ran across it in an advertisement for a Clyde's uh, steamboat line, which ran from numerous points from New York, Philadelphia, uh, uh. down to Wilmington, <laughs> Charleston, and even Savannah. And so take your pick on where this might have come to. Mm -hmm. But um, the CCD line was an acronym for the Carolina Central Dispatch Line, which at that time it originated in Wilmington, North Carolina, and ran to Charlotte which conveniently Charlotte was a very big hub which ran north to south from the Atlanta to Richmond line and so mm -hmm. I'm trying to track this I believe it came either by train or by ship to Wilmington uh, it was transported to Charlotte and then by rail to Gainesville right. and then Mr. Loud unloaded it uh, at Gainesville along with the rest of the uh, machinery. Mm -hmm. Now we don't know exactly at what point the bell was reassembled because um, this thing was done very specifically and mm -hmm. it couldn't have been some uh, blacksmith. It would have taken someone with a, a, a good facility to assemble this thing, maybe a boiler maker or something mm -hmm. like this. Um, so it's very possible someone in Gainesville could have made this, but I don't think it was made locally because there was no indication of that. Okay, so they, they, they assemble it, they, they got it working for a few months, then uh, the bad weather comes, and then what happens to it? Well, the, the newspaper basically goes blank. There was, you know, the newspaper was basically reporting a lot of the mining operations, and mm -hmm. they had been reporting about Loud's operation until, you know, that winter, and then nothing comes out. Okay. Well, digging around some of the legal documents uh, in the courthouse there, we come to find out that it seemed that they had some uh, legal problems that were starting to come mm. from some of the workers and people involved yeah. with the company right there, which makes sense because uh, since the boat was lying idle, they were losing money. Mm -hmm. And the initial newspaper account said they had spent close to $50,000 in order to finance this. Yeah. Now that equates to somewhere close to about a million dollars in today's money. So they were taking a big risk. Um, but in October of 1876, we get a very detailed and lengthy account about the sinking of the loud boat. And the last two people that saw the boat afloat besides Mr. Loud were two of his sons, uh, Philologus Jr. and the oldest son, Charles. And the account went that Mr. Loud was going to see the rest of his family who was staying in Gainesville and the two boys were accompanying him but before they went back to the boat which they were supposed to be watching they were going to see someone on some business. Well later on that afternoon or early evening when the boys get back to the boat supposedly it sunk up to the gunnels uh -huh. with the diving bell still attached to it right there and so there, the newspaper went on to say that some foul wrench with revenge in his heart went on to sink the <laughs> boat there but some accounts indicate that Charles, the oldest son, might have had something to do with this. Really? And uh, reading about his biography and doing research about him later on in life, it, it, it's very possible. Uh, the reason being was because um, 
there was an account that talked about that Charles and one of Loud's daughters were going to try to get the old man committed because yeah. they were spending the inheritance money on this well, diving bell project, which wasn't, and they were afraid mm -hmm. they were going to lose all their inheritance mm -hmm. because it was going to be spent. So it, it's very possible Just that might have happened. The thing, but yeah. with the boat itself, we still haven't found the drill hole marks in the bottom <laughs> of it to prove that yet. Do you know the total cost of what uh, the historical society and everybody involved, what this has cost y'all? Yes. It's <laughs> quite, quite, fact, it's quite substantial <laughs> between local donations, which you see mm -hmm. a number of the people's names on the plaque behind us, which we couldn't have done that without everybody, um, Cottrell's, and also a federal grant, which we had mm -hmm. to apply for and get. It was well over $150,000 wow. to yeah. help restore this and, and build this nice pavilion right here. Yeah, the but it's, pavilion is great. Tell first me more, class. Yeah, it's very nice. Tell me more about the pavilion. It's just really, the, really The pavilion is very um, significant and very interesting because uh, Richard Owens was the architect for this. Mm -hmm. Now, Richard, I mentioned Owens Farms, was mm -hmm. where they found that was uh, Richard's father, who oh. uh, they owned the Owens Farm yeah. property where the diving bell used to be located. and. Um, so Richard, when we approached him as far as uh, architectural designs, he came up with something that was very, uh, not only significant, but also symbolic. Mm -hmm. And that was that uh, the overhead of the pavilion is constructed using old world type techniques, using mortise and tenons. So you see a oh. lot of the, uh, the wooden pegs or what they mm -hmm. would have called wood nails uh, yep. in order to help hold the beams together and so forth. Um, the rock pillars, uh, the stones were donated by the Consolidated Gold Mine. So there's the gold mining uh, tie-in from right there. Um, the base of the structure itself, we have the native plants, which are you know native to this area mm -hmm. along the river here uh, in Dahlonega. Um, but the, the bottom of the structure, we have the outline, which is 50 by 17, which mimics 